Today I want us to reflect a little bit on power, the power that we have in our lives. By power I mean agency. By power I might mean the kind of space that we take up in the world. Last week Amy preached a sermon on interdependency, and if you were here and heard that sermon, um, she talked about that it's really a myth that any of us get anywhere completely on our own that that's a lie to be exposed, that we all are interdependent on one another. And I think one of the reasons we don't experience that interdependency in the way that we are meant to has to do with our use of and our position of power in the world. Are you with me so far? Okay. So tell me, how is it that we have power? What gives us power? It's the summertime, so I'm going to be a little informal to begin with. What, what gives us power in life? How, how do we take up power in the world? What gives us power? Money. Uh, huge, right? Money. Okay, what else? Education. education. Exactly. What else? Privilege, mm-hmm. which comes with education and wealth. What else? Confidence. Race. Mm-hmm. Gender, looks, looks. Mm-hmm. okay, ability, perception, perception. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to touch that. <laughs> All right, so race, education, wealth, class. The access that we have to things, health, ability. Today I want to look at this story that Laura read for us through the lens of power. So we have Jairus who had power. Now this is a story within a story. We'll start with Jairus. How did he have power? Well, he was the leader of the synagogue. He was a man. He had status. Clearly he had education or he would, couldn't have been a leader. He had social cachet. He most likely, because of the way things were at that time, also had political sway. He was a powerful man in society. And he was powerless in that moment because he couldn't make his daughter well. All the power he had and he could muster could not save his daughter. But because he had power, he went to Jesus directly and asked for what he needed. Because if we walk through the world in a certain way and we have the kind of power that we've named, we're not afraid to ask for things. Right? It's just our nature. I deserve it. I just got back from one leg of my vacation. We traveled all day. We arrived in Boston last Saturday night. We were tired. We had to still drive two hours. All middle class problems, for sure. We got off the rental shuttle bus. I was in a hurry to get in the line, and there were 40 people in front of me in the budget car rental line. 40 people. And you know how fast those move. I'm there with 40 other people. That's what it is. Somebody about 10 people behind me as the line kept growing had to get on his phone, berate whoever it was that he got a hold of budget, that he was in the line, and I really wanted to say, excuse me, sir, I don't mean to be rude, but what makes you different than the other 50 now people in this line? He was demanding that he have his car at that moment. Now, I don't know his status, but clearly he was a man who thought that he deserved something in front of other people. I don't know if Jairus was that kind of man, but what I know is this. He wasn't afraid to ask. And in that moment, in his powerlessness, he bowed before Jesus and said, can you help? Now, I don't know if Jesus had another destination, but what we know is that he turned and the crowd went with him and he went towards Jairus' house. 
character number one. Got it? Okay. <laughs> character number two, the woman with the hemorrhage. That's how we know her. She had no power. Unnamed, socially and ritually unclean. I don't need to go into all the rules around that. But in complete social isolation, she would not have been able to even enter the synagogue. She wasn't just sick for a while, she was sick for 12 years. She was ill, she was poor. How do we know that? She'd spent everything she had on the physicians. You know, it's amazing that her story even gets in the scriptures. I mean, really, she had like feminine problems. And yet her story makes it in not to just Mark's gospel, but in two other gospels as well. She has no power. Her relationship to power is very different than Jairus. And she doesn't dare approach Jesus directly. In fact, she sneaks up behind him. Did you get that? So the large crowds pressing in, she sneaks up behind him. She doesn't want to speak. She doesn't even want to be noticed. She just says, if I can just maybe touch his clothes, I'll be well. So she does just that. She touches his garment, which was even to touch his clothes, forbidden. And she is healed. She takes power. She claims it for herself. And her healing is subversive. She comes in the back door. But these two, Jairus and the woman, they both need a power greater than themselves. They both need that. And then there's Jesus, who also has power. He's educated. He's a man. He's a prophet. That can be mixed at times. He's a healer. But he's given power by the people. He's given power by his person. And what kind of hit me in the middle of the night as I woke up thinking about this text last night was also his power came from his connection to love. Because love is the most powerful force in the world. That's why he had so much power. His compassion, his open-heartedness, his fierce love. He turns around and he says, who touched me? Because he felt the power leaving him. The disciples say, you're asking us? Are you kidding me? With all these people in the crowd? But the woman overhears and emboldened by her healing. She admits it was her. She falls down still in fear and trembling, because remember, her whole life she has never confronted power in this way. But she says, it was me. And the scriptures say, she told him the whole truth. I don't know if this was the truth about her life or the truth about that moment, but she opened herself to him. And what does he say? He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Why? I want to suggest to you today that the reason that her healing and her faith were real is because power is meant to be shared. Love is inclusive. The power of God, the power of love, the power of Jesus in that moment was meant to be shared with the powerful and the powerless. You see, the one with the power, Jairus, his his story was interrupted. It was disrupted. Do you see that? Jesus is going on a way to heal his daughter. And this woman stops everything, brings things to a halt. He was interrupted. But here's the truth. The story isn't over. I didn't give you the ending in the reading. The story isn't over. But note, just for a moment, Jesus did not say to the woman, what are you doing? Can't you see that I'm attending to this very important person? 
You know that his needs come first. Didn't say that. Why? If you don't hear anything else in this sermon, hear this. Because the sharing of power is not a zero-sum game. Could use a couple more amends, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take what I can get. So to finish the story, while he is still talking to the woman, people come from Jairus' house and say to Jairus and his comrades, don't bother the teacher anymore. The child has passed. Jesus overhears this. And he says, oh, no, don't, don't be afraid, just believe. And then he takes Peter, James, and John with him. He enters the house, people are wailing. And if you've ever been in some cultures where people wail when people die, believe me, there was wailing going on. And he says, she is not dead, she's just asleep. And then they go from wailing to laughing. They laugh at Jesus that he would have said this. He takes her parents, he goes into the child's room, and he says, little girl, get up. And she did. She who was 12 years old, the parallel to the woman who was sick for 12 years. She wasn't dead, but just asleep. And as my colleague, Reverend John Kirkland, says, some of us need to be healed, and some of us need to be woke. Some of us need to be healed, and some of us need to be woke. Because those of us who have power, and many of us in this room do, for the reasons that we named, those of us who have power often miss opportunities to share power because we don't want to be interrupted or disrupted. So my questions for you today and for me, what power are you claiming? And what power are you giving away? Are you claiming power? Am I claiming power? And if so, on whose behalf? I know that many of us feel powerless over things going on in our nation. Am I alone in that? I want us to claim power. I want us to claim it locally. David Brooks wrote a wonderful article in the New York Times this week called The Localist Revolution. And he talks about working at the local level. Localism is the belief that power should be wielded as much as possible at the neighborhood, city, and state level. And localism is thriving. And localism is truly a revolution because he says it means flipping the power structure. For the past several years, decades, money, talent, and power have flowed to the centers of national power. But under localism, the crucial power center is at the tip of the shovel where the actual work is being done. Expertise is not in the think tanks, but among those who have local knowledge, those with a feel for how things work in a specific place and an awareness of who gets stuff done. Success is not measured by how big you can scale, but by how deeply you can connect. Okay? Success is not measured by how big you can scale, but by how deeply you can connect. That's power at the local level. And I saw that, and I know I've said this before, but I saw it in a profound way about a month ago when 40 people from CCSM showed up for an action to ask our county supervisors for a deportation defense fund. We had been asking them for months for $256,000, and I believe this week they will vote to give a million. That's local power. That's difference in the lives of people. Maria gave us a beautiful example of that. Local power that then extended. People at the grassroots level making a difference. What power are you claiming? And lastly, what power are you and I releasing? I think to really ask that, we ask another question. What claims our time and attention? What claims our time and attention? 
Jesus freely shared his power and he allowed himself to be interrupted. And I'm wondering, do we struggle for the rights of others or just the things that affect us? When you have power, it's easy to pretend that things aren't our issue. But a real release of power is giving up our place in line now and then. Because let's be really honest, many of us in this room are used to being at the front of the line. It's not a judgment, it's just a reality. Whether it's skin color or education or many things. It's not wrong. But are we willing to make space? See, to truly sharing power is not power over. It's not the haves and the have-nots. It's power with. Solidarity, power with. Psalm 85 say, justice and righteousness kiss. And for me, that means at some deep level, everybody wins. Because everybody's humanity is lifted up. We share power, we release, we let go, because the sharing of power, if there's anything this gospel lesson teaches us, the sharing of power is not a zero-sum game. It's at the heart of God's economy, God's kingdom, and the radical kinship that we are called to share with one another. Amen.